Oh, wow. I think he was here already before us. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Justin. That was beautiful. What a gorgeous song. <clears throat> well, I'm happy to see you all here. So, I want you to turn to somebody sitting near you, and I want you to tell them, um, I'm just so happy to see you here. <laughs> turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's precious. <laughs> there, I used to do that in my classrooms when, when we'd start class because they were coming into math class. But then, then it would put a smile on everybody's face. So look at your friend and see if there's a big smile there. This, uh, this part of the scriptures is so exciting. But are you worried about dying? Well, don't be. You're going to live forever. The question is, location, location, location. <laughs> All right. We ended with Paul, once again, being rescued by the commander from the dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin because Paul had said in his defense that he was being judged because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And some of the Pharisees even stood up and agreed with him. Yeah, what if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? Well, the minute that happened, the fight was on. Get your tickets here, folks. The Sadducees and the Pharisees are at it again. The commander who had brought him to testify to them must now rescue him from this violent dispute and have his troops take Paul back to the barracks before he was torn to pieces and on top of this, only two days before, the commander himself had learned that Paul was a Roman citizen after he tied him up and very nearly had him severely scourged. But the Lord, don't you love the buts of the Bible? The Lord stood near Paul, and he stands by us too when we get when times get hard. And Jesus said, Tharseo, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So I want you to say this word out loud. Tharseo, Tharseo. Turn to your friend and say, Tharseo. Yes. <clears throat> A sustaining presence of the Lord himself was in front of Paul. I think Paul could have reached out and touched his very robe. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not alone when King Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the blazing, fiery furnace, hotter than it had ever been before. Nebuchadnezzar looked in that fire and he saw four men, not three. And the fourth, he said, looks like the son of the gods. Just as they were not alone in the fire, Paul was not alone in prison. Christ greeted Paul with one word, the Greek word, tharseo. Turn to your friend and say, tharseo. Yes, take courage. Only Christ uses this word in the New Testament five times, and all five instances brought wonderful comfort and healing. In Matthew 9, verse 2, to the bedridden paralytic, Tharseo, say that word, Tharseo, 
Yes. In Matthew chapter 9 again, but verse 22, to the woman with the 12-year hemorrhage, Tharseo, say it again, Tharseo, yes. To his frightened disciples as he came to them across the storm-tossed sea on the Sea of Galilee, in Matthew 14, verse 27, he said, Tharseo, yes, take courage, I have overcome the world. He said it again in John 16, 33. As, yes, oh, good girl, yes, that Karen, love you, girl. This is Christ's unique word for all of us who are trying to serve him, however feebly. Christ also promised Paul further ministry in Rome. Take courage, for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Paul never wavered again, despite all the in, immense perils that later came upon him. God had a job for Paul to do, and no one or no thing could thwart God's plans. Christ had a miracle up his sleeve. Are you ready? The plot to kill Paul. The Jews were furious that night. So more than 40 of the uh, distinguished elite Sanhedrin assembly devised a plot, an evil conspiracy bound together with an oath. We hereby swear that neither food nor drink will touch our lips until this man is dead. Then they involved the chief priests and the elders to take part in this scheme by, com by petitioning the commander. How can we? Oh, yes. We would like to have um, some more information, some accurate information, Commander, on this case. And the plotters told the chief priests, we've already planned how we can kill him before he even gets here. And perhaps some back slapping and evil chuckling could be heard in the halls of the Sanhedrin. Now, enter the Holy Spirit. This is how I read God's Word. Do you do that when you're reading it, especially in a, a context like this? Verse 23 said, verse 23, 16 says, Paul's nephew went into the barracks and told Paul, What? How did this young man, this lad, find out about this secret plot to kill his uncle. Well, we have to use our imaginations here because Luke doesn't tell us the particulars in the six verses about the nephew. In the book, The Apostle, A Life of Paul, by John Pollock, a great book, he says almost certainly he had been present, unknown to Paul, in the hall of polished stones and possibly in the crowd which had heard Paul's unfinished oration from the stairs. He reported a murder plot. Whether he had been present by, at its hatching by over 40 of the young zealots or maybe in attendance when the Sanhedrin approved it in secret session. The nephew risked his future and possibly his life to betray the plot. Was he maybe, I don't know, hired to clean the building? Or, and uh, maybe he overheard the, the men raucously scheming did a schoolmate's brother's friend who knew one of the men who took the oath will never know this side of heaven. But it is intriguing. 
N.T. Wright, author of the biography called Paul, says, to our surprise, since this is the only mention of Paul's family in the whole narrative, Paul's sister's son heard about it. The lad came to tell Paul, and Paul got him to tell the commander. Interestingly, Paul doesn't mention anything about his family in any of his letters either. Sounds like a Netflix production or something sometimes. <laughs> Showing an immediate kindness. This is a new side of the commander. He took the young men by the hand, the young man by the hand, where they could talk without being overheard by the staff. He thanked him and warned him to complete secrecy, and he took immediate action. This commander knew exactly how to meet this challenge. Let's explore the way the Lord uses this commander and his office. He ordered two centurions with a hundred soldiers apiece. Seventy horsemen, can you imagine? And an additional 200 light-armed guards to take Paul to Caesarea, a hundred miles away where the governor Felix was based. The commander even wrote a handwritten note to the governor of the Roman headquarters in Caesarea. I wonder... Had that commander heard Paul speak of Christ before? I think yes. It seems entirely possible he was in control of the Jewish presence in Jerusalem. That night, they got as far as Antipatris, about halfway between Jerusalem and Caesarea. And by then, the conspirators must have realized They'd lost their chance. Kent Hughes, author of Acts, The Church of Fire, says, Paul left town on horseback. The Bible even says mounts. Surrounded by 470 soldiers. He left town more like a king than a criminal. Meanwhile, his assassins were left in town fighting insistent hunger pains. <laughs> the Life Application Bible says, God works in amazing and amusing ways. <laughs> Christ had told Paul, Tharseo, say it. Tharseo, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So what's the big deal about Rome? Well, Rome, located at the bottom of Italy, the boot that shapes Italy, is the center in those days of all power. The political, financial, cultural, everything emanated from Rome. Out of Rome flowed goods and services and information and politics, too. When the gospel takes hold in Rome, it will flow north to France and England and even Spain, even down to Africa, Paul thought. This was his vision, that the world, that the word of Christ would go all over the known world. What a quest he was on. I think Paul told Christ, I think he told Christ, Lord, I believe you with all my heart. Tharseo, may we tell the Savior the same thing. Had Paul heard, maybe from his friends, the disciples, early in his ministry years, about the times Christ had used this word? Maybe. 
Have you heard this word in your life from Christ? Maybe. The letter to Governor Felix. Now I wondered, how did Luke know what was in this letter? Well, again, we don't get to know. In any case, the cavalry delivered the letter to Governor Felix and handed Paul over to him with the letter. The governor read the letter and... On learning that Paul was from Cilicia and he was a Roman, he ordered that Paul be kept in custody in the praetorium built by Herod the Great, known as Herod's Palace. Before Governor Felix, when the when the aging priest, high priest, hurried down to Caesarea. And in his entourage brought a lawyer named Tertullus. We read about him in our study this week. Tertullus knew perfectly well that since the appointment of Felix, the governor, as governor, about five years before this, Judea had suffered widespread bloodshed from the insurrections that Felix provoked as well as an increase in political murders. Felix's greed was notorious. Josephus writes, In Judea, where matters were going from bad to worse, Felix hired terrorists to murder the high priest, Jonathan, in the temple itself. That's why... Josephus adds, in my opinion, God himself turned away from Jerusalem, our city, and brought the Romans upon us. Another Roman historian, Tacitus, describes Antonius Felix as an unscrupulous, avaricious, brutal, scheming politician. So Tertullus began his case with flowery, flattering statements of gratitude. What? To Felix, for bringing peace and reforms? No. For the benefit of this nation? Some Jews which had accompanied him even joined in alleging that these things were true. Now he presents three charges against Paul. Number one, that Paul is a troublemaker. Number two, stirring up riots in Jews around the world. How did he know the world? that Paul is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes and that Paul even tried to desecrate the temple and was apprehended by them. They hoped Felix would execute Paul right then in order to keep the peace in Palestine. Paul answered Tertullus' claims concisely. Number one, they did not find me, nor can they prove that I was causing a disturbance among the crowd in the temple, the synagogues, or anywhere in the city. He'd only been there five days. Number two, I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way, not the Nazarenes, which they called a cult, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. Paul said, I have a hope in God, which these men themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. I always strive to have a clear conscience toward God and man. After many years, I came to bring charitable gifts and offerings to my people from the Macedonian churches. Okay, once again, 
Paul presents Christ and the resurrection to his audience. For all the years since he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he presents Christ and him crucified to his audience, be it one person to a whole throng of people. Do we do that today? We have the opportunity almost every day. Felix and Drusilla, his wife, who was Jewish, sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Christ Jesus. As he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid and replied, mm, you better leave for now, but when I have an opportunity, I'll call for you. Do we do that to our Lord, to Christ Jesus? I'll call you when it's more convenient for me, God. Felix hoped that Paul would even offer him money, a bribe. Do we do that to Jesus? So Felix sent for him quite often and conversed with him. Do we just converse with Jesus only about money or, or some need that we have or trouble we might be facing? Because Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, he left Paul in prison. Do we just call on Jesus when it's time for women in the word or, or when we feel the urge? Do we need to make a serious commitment to Christ now? It's, it's right before Easter. Do we need to have a serious conversation with the one that we will spend eternity with. Well, Felix left Paul in prison for two years. Dare we leave our Lord Jesus waiting? Every story in the Bible has meaning for us, just like this one. I want to close <clears throat> with a poem called Tomorrow, and the author is unknown. He was going to be all that a mortal could be tomorrow. No one would be better than he tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up the letters he would write tomorrow. It was too bad indeed, he was too busy to see his friend, but he promised to do it tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow. The world would have known him had he ever seen tomorrow. But the fact is he died and faded from view and all that was left when living was through was a mountain of things he intended to do tomorrow. It's always the right time to do the right thing. We must each respond to God's word as it comes to us individually. On the back of your handout is a beautiful little prayer that by a theologian named John Bailey. He was born in the 1800s and died in 1960. Let's close by reading this together. By your grace, O oh God, I will go nowhere today where you cannot come, nor seek anyone's presence that would rob me of yours by your grace, I will let no thought enter my heart that might hinder my closeness with you, nor let any word come from my mouth that is not meant for your ear. So shall my courage be firm and my heart be at peace. 
Thank you. And um, Father, we love you. We praise you. And your son, Jesus, our Lord, help us to live and proclaim the truth that actually sets people free. And that is the truth of Jesus. In his holy name, amen.